Hi there, I'm Yugi Vipond and welcome to Future Food Farming brought to you by NatWest. In this episode, we're talking about technology, its current impact on the UK agriculture and whether the UK is future fit. Today, I have four experts to discuss that with me. First up, we have Leah Kennedy and Dominic Gannon, founders of the Aquaponics Garden, an aquaponics company technology uh, based in Fife, whose vision is to empower local communities and businesses to be self-sufficient whilst preserving the environment through the adoption of the aquaponics garden system. Good to have you with us, guys. Thank, Thank you very you much. <laughs> Hi there. Now, we also have Dave Ross, the CEO of the Agri Epicenter, aiming to enable a world where engineering and precision aquaculture technologies, systems and ecosystems are optimised in order to maximise the agri-tech sector's contribution to sustainable food production and supply. Dave, hello there. Hi, Dougie. Hi, everyone. And finally, we also have Tim Byrne, the Managing Director of Abacus Bio International, a consulting business to home to some of the very best scientific minds around. The need to solve problems is at the heart of innovation and competitive advantage in agriculture, and Abacus Bio helps businesses with both. Tim, good to have you with us. Thanks, Dougie. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tim. I'm going to start with you, Dominic and Leah. How did you get in? To the industry in the first place and what kind of support did you get to to get started it's a mixture of both of our backgrounds really so i'm half filipino half scottish and growing up in the philippines i was exposed to extremes whether that was social political environmental and from a very young age i witnessed pristine islands develop so quickly to to feed the demand of international tourism that i knew that the direction that we were going in just wasn't right and that there had to be a change. So I thought I'm gonna go and study environmental science and try to get to the root of the problem. I often had a really heavy weight on my shoulders, often coming to Dom and saying, I don't know what, how we can help or what we could do. And so I called him for a cup of coffee one day and I just said, okay, so if there was one world problem that you could help solve, there are so many world problems, what would it be? And because of our love for food, we're always talking about food, always looking to try new types of food. And uh, then we decided on the sustainability of food production. It's, it's a really big problem. And I said, there's technology to solve the problems of the state sustainability of production, right? But why is it that we're not using the technology more? Why is it not more available to people? And I don't know when it went from that to consuming us and it's our whole lives now it's sort of just it, we, we just went on this way and um and we're here now the support that we've had is incredible honestly i i'm we are so lucky to to have um the support we do our families have been extremely supportive as well and um we actually received our first investment from rock spring who are dominic's family investment company who invest in disruptive startup technology and that allowed us to build our pilot system and it also allowed us to uh, hire our employees and build our team. So uh, our pilot system is based on SRUC Elmwood's campus. We've had incredible support from them as well, from their students volunteering at our facility to advice as well as their agronomists uh, introducing us to local farmers. Other than that, winning winning the Converge Challenge last year, the Impact Challenge, um, was was a turning point for the business. We've received a lot of business support as well as our team has grown in terms of our advisors. We were approached by different people. Winning the Alison Rose Award at the same time was a turning point for me personally. From that, I had invaluable conversations and really motivational conversations with women from RBS as well as NatWest, including Susan Fouquier, uh, Paula Ritchie, Melinda O'Reilly, and even Alison Rose. And uh, we, we discussed, you know, being a female working in a male dominated environment and we shared stories in that space. And she reminded me to always just remember to be myself. And it was really great. So from these conversations a lot has changed in the business and we've we've pushed ourselves to where we are now so the support has been amazing and we're really we're really grateful for where we are now and and dominic your um start point of, of with this you know leah came to you and spoke to you about this was you come of you know coming from the same mindset in terms of setting up um your own company that's uh it's a very interesting question uh i think there were similar mindsets but 
um, my background in investment meant that I was kind of looking for a way into a career in, in investment. But at the time, I, I felt uh, I felt untrusted of the, the markets and, and how pricing was made. So I kind of shifted my focus towards sort of sustainable technologies. And I really wanted to find a, te a sustainable technology that I could make into a, a big company and be profitable, but sustainable at the same time. So when Leia came to me with this and we kind of started talking about it, I was doing a master's in entrepreneurship, innovation and management. And I just uh, sold a, a prior business that I'd set up with, with five of my friends. So I was kind of looking for the next opportunity. And when we talked about this, it just seemed obvious. It was sort of four years ago when before the massive kind of growth in, in appetite and vertical farming. Um, and it just seemed like somebody needed to focus hard on developing technology that everybody could use. And that was one of Lair's main points initially was, if we're gonna get into this, we need to develop a technology that's gonna grow food that everybody can purchase. And in my head, obviously, I was like, I, I don't know how that's gonna, gonna work. You know, most of vertical farming companies make, you know, have serious margins on the microgreens and the leafy greens and, and high value things for restaurants. And it's a daunting task, I think, to, to develop a technology that can produce something at a, at a cost that everybody can afford. But that's the overall all challenge. And, you know, we've got a long way to go, but we're, we're focused on getting there. Um, so you know, I hope that's answered the question. Uh, it certainly has. And Dave, let's talk a bit about you, because, you, you know, you used to be involved in academia and now you're kind of on the other side of, and kind of be more business focused. How did... You know that come about in the first place and how did you get you know in your kind of build your relationship with the, the aquaponics garden so Dougie, going back my career history um it's slightly longer than the two previous contributors so i'll, I'll try and cut to the chase a little <laughs> bit um my uh my previous academic experience really was focused on uh the both the high value crop the crop and it and laterally for the past sort of dozen years or so focused on livestock and it was really focused on technology improvements, things that the industry could use, but developing from an academic perspective to try and work and develop these new tools and technologies and deliver on wearing an academic hat, but working very closely with industry. And I found personally the, the, the excitement and the, the passion of getting something successfully deployed in industry was, was a bit of a drug for me. And uh, so that that led me to the, the path, the career path that I find myself on now. Um, nothing, no, nothing's ever planned in life, but this one, this one had an element of planning in it. So the uh, the opportunity came about in sort of 2015 or so for um, a UK government sponsored initiative to create agricultural or agri tech or agri food centres of innovation, and eventually the. Um, after a sort of down selection process, they focused on four areas. One was focused on livestock particularly, one was focused on crops and all the challenges around crop protection products, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one was focused on what's called big data, which is the advent of the big data scenario, especially to the agri-food supply chain. And the one that's left is the one that I, the one I liked was focused on particularly the technology, the engineering, the precision technologies that could be deployed on farm. And so I, I grasped what, what, what then, then was a very large nettle and um, started my journey in trying to create this, uh, this business or develop this business from a standing start in about mid 2016. And uh, the, there was an element, there still is an element of government co-support in this, but the function that we now provide in my new world, wearing a more industrial hat, is effectively more a facilitator and an enabler for industry and academia to work more closely together. And what that means from a practical standpoint is to identify what the industrial problems are in the food sector, right through the food sector from agri right through to retail. Try and then map that and get the appropriate expertise or capacity within the UK or even abroad to try and deliver on a solution for that. And um, that's the kind of role that we've established and maintained and delivered projects on ever since. So um, from that humble beginnings, we're now at, I think about 175-ish industrial members ranging from companies like Amazon, which is our, one of our members, down to 
the likes of equivalent companies like Aquaponics Garden, very, very small startups in the start of their journey to create some commercial success and find some niche or a growth sector growth element in the in the food sector. So that's where we sit. It's starting to work both nationally and actually internationally now. We've got good links with South America, China, and would you believe it, New Zealand. And brings me on very nicely to Tim then. <laughs> uh, so Tim, you're in a kind of slightly similar position to Dave in that your company sort of brings minds together, you know, the innovators and the people on the side of technology, and you're kind of bringing them together with agriculture businesses. So how do you think is the best way you know, for, for both of them to develop and, and to move forward. Uh, thanks, Doogie. Uh, when I reflect on what um, what Dom and Dave have said, uh, like uh, there's a couple of things there that really resonate with me, and it's it's those things that Abacus used to help companies innovate. I think the first is that um, there needs to be a clear demonstration of the value proposition for innovation. So. Um, economic is obvious, you know, the economic value proposition is obvious, but increasingly so environmental, social and other propositions that need to be demonstrated clearly to, to the businesses that are expected to do this innovation. Um, so I, I think we can't forget that. Something that Dave pointed to, which I think is relevant in um, enabling business businesses to innovate is to translates kind of the complexity that is often seen in innovation and, and make that into effective solutions that are simple enough um, to work in, in a complex business environment. Um, there's lots of examples of innovation sitting on the shelf because it's too complex or too difficult to implement in a real business environment, or maybe it hasn't been communicated effectively as it can be. So generating, you know, some simplicity in the solution so that it actually works in a complex business environment, I think is really important. Uh, and then finally, and probably most importantly, is about really listening to the needs of businesses. And it sounds a little bit cliche, but I guess identifying problems first and then finding a solution rather than having a solution and then going to look for something to solve with it. So there's some examples of that as well. The first one that comes to mind for me is drones. Like there was a big wave of enthusiasm for drones. I mean, often it was a drone looking for a problem to solve rather than the other way around. So um, I think that's really important. And Another thing worth mentioning, I think, is, is about risk. Agriculture is, is usually quite a tight margin business. And unlike a lot of other industries, there's only about 30 opportunities, right? There's 30 seasons, if you like, um, for a farmer or an agribusiness to get, to get it right. So there's quite a big risk in, in giving away one of those seasons. You give away the year's worth of, of profit if you get it wrong. So... I think businesses like Abacus Bio and other advisory businesses, including Dave's, for example, can do a lot to, to support the management of risk uh, through the innovation pipeline. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. Now, uh, Leigh, I want to speak to you again about you know, technology then. So what kind of technologies in your market that the Aquaponics Garden are now using and developing? Because as Dave and uh, Tim both said, you know, it, it, there's a lot out there, isn't there? So what, what, what kind of technology are you using within your specific type of aquaculture? Thank you, your pardon, Aquaponics, I beg your pardon, it's the wrong word. No, no, no. It, well, it's an it's a, it's a important component of it. Um, the tech side is really, um, is more what Dom is focused on. So I'm going to let him talk about it. But we use a mixture of IoT and sensors but what Tim was talking about earlier, I think that we, you know, we resonate with a lot of what you were saying in terms of, you know, not developing a solution that doesn't have a problem yet. You know, that was a key um, focus of ours at the beginning, instead of just having a solution and then, and then uh, saying everybody buy the solution. We're trying to dig deeper into, you know, what do farmers need or what do businesses really need? How can this solution fit? And then the second thing is also what you're talking about, the sim simplicity of the innovation that we really resonate with as well, because adoptability of a system is really important. So if you have technology that can't be used, then it, it goes nowhere. So one thing that we're really focusing on is making it easily adoptable, but we're doing that in a number of ways. And, and yeah, Dom, Dom will elaborate more. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Developing 
uh, technology that has a real commercial and immediate commercial purpose is, is, is our game. That's what we're trying to do is build a, a system that we can directly put into the food production supply chain and reduce that, that um, uncertainty of margin as well. Because if we can reduce the, the length of the supply chain, then we can improve margins. So there's the economic side, there's a massive sustainability side to this as well. Um, but in terms of the technology, it's got a vital role to play in enabling the aquaponics garden to develop a crop production system that can be easily adopted, as Lair says, monitored both at the facility site, but also remotely and scaled. A lot of our startup journey has been, you know, sleepless nights thinking about the amount of water that's flowing around the facility and, and all the problems that might occur. And, you know, stopping Sunday lunch because we need to go in because we've seen that there's, a, there's an issue. You know, there, these are all the things that we don't want our customers to have to experience. So we're, you know, overcoming those bit by bit. I was really lucky to be one of the first people to see the first ever Raspberry Pi which is one of Britain's most successful selling computers now. Um, and that has really shaped the way that I think about technology and the adoptability of technology, and also how you can see everything that's happening and the ability to repair things if, if small problems happen. Um, so as a result, we've, we've you know, ad adopted and slightly adapted mostly off the shelf technologies, such as you know, internet of things, sensors, microcontrollers and computers to build a system that can communicate with its operators, enabling the operator to then make critical decisions through a dashboard. Because that's the key thing. I want to see if something's wrong. If nothing's wrong, then, then let's just leave all the lights green and be happy with our Sunday lunch, right? So um, <laughs> the key for us is, is to develop a system that despite having many, many layers of complexity, which I'm sure <laughs> Dave can, can appreciate, um, we want to be able to enable it to be used by high level scientists, but also entry level technicians so that everybody can find a use for it, not just the top level sort of data processing site. Um, but in amongst that ch challenge is then developing it in a sustainable but cost effective way. You know, this needs to be low cost for everybody to adopt. So we're about to embark on a major round of fundraising to fund the next iteration of the aquaponics garden, the, the Mark II, um, with the aim of then getting our first product to market in 18 to 24 months, which is a massive challenge. But we have a library of, of development projects that we need to get cracking on with, that we need funding with. Um, and it's all about enabling the adoption of the, the system through the innovation, through the technology. Does that make sense to you? It makes sense. It does. Absolutely. I want to ask both of you before I open it out to Dave and Tim as well. You know, you say you mentioned off the shelf technology, but, you know, technology is an ever changing world as, as well, you know, and it moves very, very fast indeed. How do you go about choosing what off the shelf um, products that you're going to use to develop for the for the fact you for your final sort of um, uh, product? It starts with 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 trying. So we have a bit of a fail fast attitude at the Aquaponics Garden. So we'll we'll try something. If it fails, we'll try to uh, adapt it or, or, or bring a new piece of hardware in. Um, we're also really lucky in that we we work with some really bright um, sort of hardware and software engineers um, from a couple of different companies. One of them being Census, and one of them being MBS three six five and They've been in the IoT hardware space already for the past sort of four or five years. So they are able to kind of quickly look at what the appropriate hardware is, but then we look at it and we see whether it will fit in the context of, of aquaponics farming. It's, it's about finding the balance between cost and quality. You know, you don't want to get something that's too cheap that's, that you're going to have to replace so many times, but you also don't want to spend so much and, you know, for some things, buying lots of cheap things to get a, a range of data is better than getting one really expensive thing and having one data point, for example. It's a balance uh, and it's, and yeah, exactly, fail fast. We just try it, see if it works. If it doesn't, try again, just keep going. And, and Leah, for you as well, of course, the, the, there's the added layer of making sure that if, you know anything you're taking on board is not causing you know the environment any issues as well so you're adding that extra layer of, of challenge for the right reasons into into your product it's a really crucial part and um it 
is it's probably the hardest part because you know materials are not sustainable i mean just in general us living here on earth you know everything we do is has an impact so you that again you have to strike the balance and what we try to do a lot is repair so instead of chucking something out taking it apart seeing if it can still be used or taking pieces that can still be used and um and also trying to look source locally as much as possible um so it, it it's a difficult balance and we hope that in the future we can reach a, a position where the system as a whole is is sustainable not just it's it's running but also the materials that we use we want to go beyond the, the the standard things that we say about the sort of vertical farming that sort of 95 percent less water use and the rest of it because ultimately Leia came up with this idea which was a, a holistically sustainable food production system and that looks at the materials, that looks at the inputs, that looks at everything. So when you think about it in that context, you know, we're on a very long journey. You know, we're not going to get there in the next couple of years. But um, you talking about that sustainability thing made me think about something uh, that, that Dave was, was talking about. And I wondered whether you could weigh in, Dave, on how your conversations about sustainability with businesses, but also farmers are received and whether generally it's a positive conversation that you have or whether you get resistance, because we definitely find both ends of, of the spectrum where you get positive responses and negative responses. And we want to build a, a, a company that works for the benefit of the farmer. And we don't want to talk about sustainability in a way that sort of puts them down. Mm -hmm. um, what we're just trying to do is, is help them reach targets that governments are, are setting to hit. Uh, you know, net zero by 2040, which is a massive challenge. And how are they going to be able to do that without adopting profitable technologies that can make sure that they're still, you know, earning their good living? Uh, that's a very, very big topic. And I, I, I personally, from my experience, commend you both for looking at the holistic view of your system, because I think that that's going to be one of the things in future that we're going to have to take into account for all agricultural production. We've gone through the, what's called the green revolution in, you know, in the 60s, etc., where we've focused, we've gone through monocultivation, we've gone through high inputs, we've gone through advanced chemistries, um, and there have been one or two casualties along the way, which is you know, obviously things like biodiversity, um, concentration of the genetics into smaller pools of productive capacity, both in crops and livestock. And one, one of the other things um, which in the new challenges that we have both in biodiversity and net zero is to look i think more holistically at the, at the food production process where the nutrient flows need to work for all and you know the challenge is always to get the most efficient nutrients flowing we have challenges for nutrition in plants across the, the world in, in the uk it's getting slightly better but in some instances there's an over application of nitrogen into crop production, which is then has a knock-on effect, both on the environment in, in, in the, water, the water streams, et cetera, but also has a knock-on effect on climate change. And therefore, that looking at holistically in the nutrient flows and making most use of efficient nutrient flows, whether it be in a contained system that you've developed, but also in broad acre and traditional, what I would call outdoor, in inverted commas, agriculture, Looking at it more holistically, I think is something that we will need to pivot to a degree in future to meet all these parallel challenges that agriculture has got to meet. There's a people keep talking about a perfect storm coming of food production, net zero, um, etc., and that's coming upon us, and we're seeing it through policy initiatives, COP26 coming. Um, there's a lot of pressure on the food supply chain, and let's face it the agri-food or the ag bit of the food production system is a globally about 24% of the greenhouse gas emissions pie chart. So it's, it's, it's higher than automotive and aerospace, etc. So it's a big chunk that we're responsible for. So the environmental push and the holistic approach, I think, is great. I'm not sure if that's answered your question correctly, Dominic, but it's my best take on it. Uh, I like answer. to really yeah. good answers, lots of nodding heads. So yeah, it sounds like we're we're of the same mind, which is encouraging. Good stuff. Now, Tim, I want to talk to you about you know obviously keeping in mind this you know the, the fact that you know the 
you know, the, the impact on the environment long term is going to be something that's high in our mind for a long, long time, uh, as it should be. But how can we kind of, um, you know, get farmers and people who are, you know, producing food, um, how can we encourage them to take on technologies? Because let's face it, the future is going to be ever changing. And do you find that when you're speaking to people who are actually producing food, that they're open minded to technology or are they kind of more like, oh, we've been doing it this way for a long time, so we're actually doing fine, thanks very much. When I reflect on the sort of situation farmers are in, um, they have to walk a very fine line, right, between their livelihood, which is about making money, and also preservation of the environment and contribution to public good and things like that. And I think for them, it's getting increasingly hard to walk that line. So farmers need support to, to manage that. And if, I, if you then overlay sort of technology and innovation on top of that fine line, that is another level of complexity for them. And farmers are throwing all sorts of things, lots of different opportunities. And it's actually quite difficult for them to navigate what they should adopt, what the risk profile of each is and what it means in the long term, especially in the context of you know, a policy framework, which is also changing. So how can we help farmers navigate that. We have to uh, work closely with them to understand their businesses, I think. And I reflect back again on the sort of the risk profile of farmers. Um, Dave mentioned a, a restructuring of the whole food supply chain. So that's very disruptive, right? That is a massive change from what, what farming is now. So supporting farmers and making decisions about what technologies GTUs is important, uh, simplifying things as much as possible. I say that not reflecting on what farmers can cope with. I just say that reflecting on how complex their business already is and what they're going to need to, to navigate, you know, that, that tightrope between economic and environmental and social bottom line. And has, you know, is there an open mind there, do you think, generally for the people that, you, you know, you've been speaking to? I guess if they're speaking to you, they are really open-minded to technology. But do you think that, you know, across the industry, that they are open-minded to change and positive change? No, I think certainly. Like, like in any industry, there's a, uh, there's a range of views. Like Dom referred to the spectrum of views about the need to change. And I think one thing that will help a lot is, is, a, is succession in the farming business. I'm sure everybody on this call has heard that, had a conversation about that before. Young minds with new ideas and new ways of doing things need to come into agriculture. And it's probably a little bit slow now. It's probably a little bit slow now to, to create behavior change because ultimately this is about behavior change. Younger people with new ideas, I think, will help fast track that behavior change. Finally, I'm going to finish with this because we're, we're this is called Future Fit Farming. So... Is UK agriculture fit for the future? And if it isn't, um, what does it have to do? So I want to ask that question of all of you, and Tim might reflect on the New Zealand situation at the end as well. But um, Leah, I'm going to come to you first of all. Is agriculture in the UK fit for the future? And if it isn't, what do you reckon it has to do? I would say in many ways, yes, but also in many ways, no. So in the UK, uh, we have world-class agricultural practices you know we're leading in a lot of different parts of the sector but i think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done and there are a lot of challenges that we have to overcome if we want to reach the 2040 net zero targets for england and wales and 2045 for scotland but um i think that the key is really collaboration and education so coming together uh using innovation and really being able to deploy it and also educating people on you know new technologies to reduce the risk or the perceived risk of some of the technologies and also the support you know we talked about how farmers are treading that fine line and we really want to make sure that we develop technology that works alongside farmers and and it works with them and not against them because they have a really hard job uh you know feeding our um population and so uh providing more support for them really i think is is key and and yeah education collaboration but okay dominic same the same question to you the big question to you too please um it's a really good question when i when i think about this i think about our 
imports and exports situation in the UK and what you know the supply chain truly looks like. And it's not good. We don't we don't produce as much food that that, that we need to, um, you know, nationally. So in times of crisis, and you know, when we're thinking about the future, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about population growth, but we're also thinking about climate change, and we're thinking about you know uncertainties through pandemics as well. So when we think about this question, we've got to look at how we responded during you know Brexit, and we've responded during COVID. And for the people that you know are at the end of the supply chain, it's been really difficult. You know, the UK is an island that has remote communities. Obviously, we've got massive cities like London that are part of this worldwide international supply chain. But you know, for for our, our you know people that are living on, on the outskirts and and at the end of the supply chain in the countryside, it's difficult for them to access that nutritious you know uh, food at a good price as well. So I'd say you know the UK agriculture is is not quite fit for the future yet. But through, you know, you know, what Dave was saying in terms of support through governmental policies and also the, the epicenters that, that Dave is part of, they have a massive role to play in ensuring that, you know, the, the agriculture, se agricultural sector and the people that are developing the technology for the sector are working closely enough so that when that development happens, it can be incorporated straight into the supply chain immediately rather than having to wait 10 or 20 years. You know, when I think about achieving net zero for agriculture in 2040, I think that's a long way away. We need to work quicker than that, I think. Absolutely. Dave, what, the same question to you then. The, the big one about uh, is the UK agriculture fit for the future or indeed does it have to change? I think it has to change. And I think that are, uh, but, but, uh, I would suggest it's possibly evolutionary rather than revolutionary, or perhaps a combination of both. There are some revolutionary elements of which, I, you know, the aquaponic space is, a, is I would consider a more revolutionary aspect. Um, but for the other components of agriculture, there are pressures. It, it's an incredibly complex landscape with different commodities having different pressures. I'll cite an example, such as the obviously the labour supply that we've had as a consequence of Brexit. And that tightening of your labour supply has made it more difficult for certain commodities to be picked, harvested, monitored, etc. in our high value sector. And are there technological solutions to that? Yes, there are, but they're probably a few years away from being robust and reliable enough to be deployed. But if they are deployed, does that create a, a robust indigenous economy producing those commodities, better balancing our payments in terms of you know, food security for the UK? The answer is yes to all of these things. If it all works right and we adopt the technology and we have the right players and actors in all of the supply chain to produce that product to make it happen. So it's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge that we're on a journey on again. Uh, but agriculture over the years has had to change many times. It's had to adapt to new circumstances and it has had to develop. So I, I'm positive for the future. I think there will be adaptation. I think new minds will come in. They'll look at it from a fundamental perspective, the revolutionists, as I would call them, and the evolutionists will look at how they can do things better. Um, tapering off, you know, increasing something by 1% in terms of productivity generally is a win-win with net zero. You, you tend to get a, not 1%, but close to, 1% gain there. And anything that we can do just now over the crucial next 10 to 12 years in terms of net zero is something that we can really put in the bank for 2040 and 2050 where we've really got to hard hit and get there. So um, I, I think we're lots of things to do. I think there's some changes to happen. There's challenges across the dividing line of environmental management, land management for public goods which will be a necessary component of this, including a necessary component for both biodiversity and net zero. But we still have to have a productive landscape and we still have to have an element of food security. I look to countries or territories like, for example, Singapore, which had a policy up until the pandemic, the policy was very much import most, if not all of its food. That pivoted 180 degrees a few weeks into the pandemic. And now they're gung-ho about food security to get up to 30% by, I think it's 2030. So food security is going up the agenda post pandemic, it absolutely is. And I think there's an opportunity for the UK to 
grow more product. We're, I mean, um, I'm frustrated slightly by our partners in Netherlands, where they're the, you know, the world's second biggest exporter uh, for the size of territory. And our landscape and our territory across, you know, Scotland and England, um, we can compete. And can we have that large production capacity in the UK with the ambition and all the actors and this enthusiasm of farmers, etc., to grab that opportunity in a tight commodity price world, I will grant you that, can, they, can we have that investment to create that wonderful, what I call panacea of locally grown produce, which I think is wonderful. I'll finish on that. Love it. We all think that's wonderful. Absolutely, we do. But uh, Tim, I'll ask the same question to you to, to finish off. Is UK agriculture fit for the future? And if not, what needs to be done? I think uh, my response sort of mirrors Leah's response in that in a way it is fit for the future it it's got a good track record in providing for the environment and other public goods i think the policy that's been in place in the uk compared to new zealand for example has meant that the uk has probably done a better job than new zealand at protecting the environment it's fit for purpose in terms of health and welfare and traceability standards certainly and that it has to be maintained because that's um an increasing expectation from consumers. So it's certainly fit for purpose on, on that front. But there are some fundamental challenges with it, I think. Um, and they are things like, for example, farm scale. The, the expectation globally is that food should be cheap. Um, and it's quite hard to produce cheap food off small areas of land. So there's some structural um, challenges to overcome to, to move to move the industry forward. It's true in New Zealand as well, but I think it's even more true here and it's about balancing the expectations of rural and urban communities in order for the UK farming industry to become more fit for the future, I think heaps of support and, and communication around balancing those expectations of rural and urban communities will help. Uh, but I'm like everybody else here, I'm super positive. I think the, the direction of travel is right um, in terms of restructuring the way farmers are rewarded for maintaining the environment and protecting public good. Um, and yeah, there's heaps of technology out there. And I think supporting the industry and farmers and implementing the right technologies at the right time will, will take the UK forward. Tim, thank you very much indeed. And thanks also to all the guests on Future of Fit Farming brought to you by NatWest. In the next episode, we'll be talking about the future of cooperative farming in the UK. For more information about agriculture, go to NatWest Business Hub slash agriculture. Mm -hmm.